As Dr. Potter mentioned, uh, I've done two of the case studies in our forthcoming volume and contributed to a third one. The one I'd like to talk about today is the origins of the Nuclear Suppliers Group, although I would be delighted to talk as well about the South Africa case study if you'd like me to, but I did that last year, so I'm not, um, I'm not gonna cover that again. Um, so <clears throat> we'll hear a little bit later from Paul and Nikolai. Hmm? Okay, Eduardo's telling me to move closer. Um, I'll hear from, we'll hear from Paul and Nikolai a little bit later about uh, U.S.-Soviet cooperation in the context of some of the legally binding instruments that comprise uh, the non-proliferation regime. But I have the opportunity here to explore uh, that type of cooperation in the context of more informal arrangements, um, namely the London Club, which is the precursor to what we know today as the Nuclear Suppliers Group. So I'm going to start my brief presentation by looking at how the United States approached and engaged the Soviet Union uh, in developing um, an international set of export control guidelines in 1974. I'm then going to examine how the two countries worked together in a multilateral context to overcome some of the barriers to achieving consensus guidelines. And I'm gonna finish up by identifying some of the factors that made these efforts successful. I think these are, are valuable because they point to some of the circumstances that I think could help revive US-Russia uh, non-proliferation cooperation today. So I'll begin with a little bit of background here, and this may be history that, that you know, but uh, please feel free to ask if you have any questions. Um, the United States and, and the Soviet Union both kind of came into the nuclear era uh, with a very guarded approach to sharing nuclear technology and sharing nuclear know-how. Uh, because of concerns about other countries, of course, getting the bomb. But by 1953, with, uh, with the Atoms for Peace speech that President Eisenhower delivered, and then the subsequent adoption of the U.S. Atomic Energy Act, we see a real transformation in U.S. Uh, policy toward export controls and, and policy towards non-proliferation. Uh, then the United States started to encourage its uh, domestic nuclear suppliers to export nuclear technology, particularly in the developing world. And one of the things that I found interesting in my research is that this was actually part of um, sort of U.S. foreign policy. It was an effort to counter uh, communist influence in, in the developing world. We saw the Soviet Union undertake a kind of corresponding um, evolution in its nuclear policy, they became much more open, much more interested in exporting research reactors and power reactors. And uh, you really see over the next decade the two countries kind of engaging both in a nuclear arms race but also in uh, what I believe Dr. Potter called in one of his articles a nuclear peace race. So you can see them kind of competing with one another in a growing nuclear export. If I can interrupt market. for just a Please second, do. because first of all, you can see how, how well coordinated this is. I thought you were going to be speaking on the South African <laughs> case, which is why I changed the order. But, uh, and I also didn't bring with me something that I just received uh, from a colleague who's now retired uh, from the U.S. Department of State. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a collection of various volumes uh, that uh, he had picked up over the years. And in it, uh, most interestingly, was a brochure dated 1955, mm. which was an exhibition organized in English, organized by the Soviet Union with respect to uh, their uh, nuclear uh, energy and uh, nuclear uh, power related uh, exports. Mm. So it's a kind of a glossy brochure. I'll pass it around if you want. I just, that would be great. just opened it up uh, earlier this week. So it reinforces the point that, uh, that you're making here, Sarah. Exactly. And I think, I mean, one of the things that we've, we've obviously done a lot of work with declassified sources, of which there are now many, and many of them are available online, which has been a huge help. Um, I found some references to the fact that the United States was so eager to kind of utilize nuclear exports as a, as a way to um, facilitate its foreign policy objectives that they were making promises about s technology that they could provide to you know, third world countries that, w that they hadn't even really developed or refined for use at home. So this was you know, very big business for them and, and also very closely tied into their foreign policy objectives. Um, things did start to change a little bit, I would say, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, and in 1968, you can really see uh, both the United States and the Soviet Union start to think more seriously about some of the proliferation consequences of, of this practice. 
Um, of course, as we know, the NPT uh, reinforces and codifies the right of uh, non-nuclear weapon states parties to the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, but it's predicated on their acceptance of safeguards agreements that they negotiate with the IAEA. Um, subsequent to the conclusion of the NPT in 1971, the Zanger Committee started to convene to determine what types of uh, equipment would trigger the application of IAEA safeguards. So nuclear suppliers are really entering a mode where they started to consider more carefully the dual use nature of, of the atom. Now, May of 1974 changed everything. Um, India, which was and is today a non-NPT state, conducted what it referred to as a peaceful nuclear explosion using plutonium that it had derived from a Canadian reactor uh, and actually heavy water that the United States had supplied. Um, this was a, a very vivid example for policymakers, particularly in Washington, but really all over the world, about how civilian equipment and uh, equipment that was intended to be used for civilian purposes could be diverted uh, to military ends. And it also showcased that um, sort of verbal assurances that, and political assurances that material and equipment was not going to be used for military purposes really wasn't sufficient. And I know Nikolai is probably going to get into that uh, when he looks at uh, safeguards. Um, so with this in mind, policymakers in Washington began a very concerted effort in the summer of 1974 to close some of these perceived loopholes, and they would continue with these activities uh, in the context of the London Club through uh, 1978. So <clears throat> in May of 1974, immediately following India's test, the National Security Council recommended to President Nixon that he approve consultations with other countries to start coordinating their export policies more carefully and more closely. And by July of that same year, uh, Henry Kissinger, who was at the time the Secretary of State, was working closely with his analytical staff to take steps to kind of implement this directive in practice. And what we see from the declassified documents from this period uh, is that uh, the buy-in of the USSR was immediately identified as a very, very important objective for US policymakers in this effort. Um, this was partly to ensure that when the United States kind of came down hard on India for this, what it perceived as a misuse of, of peaceful nuclear equipment, um, that India wouldn't then immediately be able to turn to the Soviet Union as an alternate supplier, um, and, and so that India, or, U.S. and Soviet um, kind of efforts on this uh, on this issue were on the same page. Um, at the same time, the, direct, the director of ACTA, who was at the time Freddie Clay, felt very confident that the Soviet Union would be a good partner for the United States on this particular issue because they had a similar uh, experience with the Chinese, where they provided nuclear equipment and then the Chinese had used it to develop a nuclear weapon. So Kissinger and his staff were very eager to engage the Soviet Union, and they also wanted to ensure that if they started to adopt more stringent um, conditions for nuclear supply, that the Soviet Union wouldn't be able to undercut them on the international market. So it's very important to them that, that they do this in parallel. And last, but very much not least, and this is something that will come up later in our findings, the US and the Soviet Union had a pretty good thing going at this moment. This was, you know, during the period of detente, a lot of the case studies that we examined in our book were happening around the same time period. So they had a very uh, good and practiced um, mechanism for uh, non-proliferation cooperation. And I think they were they, they felt confident that they could utilize this in this particular instance. So it was on this basis that the United States launched a targeted approach to get the Soviet Union um, to coordinate efforts on strengthening uh, the export regime. So in the fall of 1974, uh, US policymakers arranged for four bilateral plenary sessions with the USSR with the objective of coordinating export policies. Um, the other important part of, of what they hoped to accomplish through these meetings was to secure Soviet agreement to participate in a series of multilateral meetings um, among nuclear exporters that they were going to convene the following year. As a basis for their conversations with the USSR, um, the US based policymakers used a five point ed memoir that uh, Winston Lord and Freddie Clay had drafted that had 
some examples of the types of export guidelines that they hoped the Soviets would, would also be willing to support. Um, they had good reason to think that these would be well received and that they wouldn't have any trouble selling them to the Soviet side. And in fact, you can see, I love, this is a quote from some talking points that were drafted for Charles Van Doren uh, leading up to these meetings, where you can see his characterization that the Soviets really had um, you know, no less restrictive export control policies than the United States has. They were really very much on the same page in this particular issue. Also, there were concurrent negotiations going on basically at the same time on the TTBT and the Peaceful Nuclear Explosions Treaty. I'm assuming it's a TT. Sure, it's the Threshold Test Ban Treaty. Um, and these had created not only a good atmosphere for other negotiations in related spaces, but they also provided both sides with some good practical ideas for literally how to coordinate their meetings that they utilized. So for example, at the first of these plenary meetings in the fall of 1974, um, Walter Stessel and his, uh, his Soviet counterpart proposed trading off the chairmanship of their meetings because that was something that they used previously and it kind of gave a, a sense of equity to the meetings and allowed them to, to um, move forward in a more productive fashion. So this is not to, to paint an overly rosy picture of, of you know, how the negotiations went. Of course, there were still a number of challenges that the two sides had to overcome. Um, the first was that the United States was very eager to keep the focus of these plenary meetings uh, quite narrow. They only wanted to talk about export guidelines and secure Soviet agreement to participating in this forthcoming larger multilateral meeting of, export, of exporters. Um, the Soviet side, conversely, was interested in having a much broader conversation on a number of complex measures to consolidate the non-proliferation regime. And this is a theme that we'll see you know, repeatedly throughout our case studies. And I know, Nikolai, that's something that, that comes up for you in your cases as well. Um, the USSR was also very eager to have ongoing bilateral negotiations with the United States on a range of issues. And the United States very clearly saw that these needed to happen in a multilateral setting. Um, they were concerned that if this did not happen, other nuclear suppliers would again be able to kind of undercut the United States and the Soviet Union in the larger nuclear suppliers market. Now both sides did show a good deal of flexibility in, in sort of overcoming uh, this impasse. The United States expressed that it would be willing to represent Soviet interests in a larger group of nuclear suppliers if the USSR didn't feel like it was politically feasible for them to attend these meetings. And this wasn't unprecedented. This was actually the approach that they also used at the Zanger Committee meetings. It was pretty remarkable if you think about it. Um, and additionally, the United States acquiesced finally after being worn down after several months to hold ongoing periodic talks with the Soviet Union on a whole host of non-proliferation issues. Um, this combination really proved to be the ticket. By November of 1974, um, Roland Timurbayev was calling Washington and, and agreeing to participate in the multilateral export suppliers meeting that was going to be held the next year. And in fact, by January of 1975, uh, he and his counterparts were you know, calling, calling the DC office and saying, when is this meeting gonna happen? When is this meeting gonna happen? Really, really champing at the bit. So we've gotten from the bilateral consultations to the multilateral <coughs> consultations. Um, this was not, the only issue that this group had to overcome, though, they still had to actually negotiate a set of guidelines. And I know we don't have a lot of time, so I, I won't dwell too much on these, but I want to highlight a couple of the challenges that the US and the Soviet Union had to overcome in this setting. Um, if the US felt like Soviet participation in these meetings was important because of similarities in the US and Soviet export uh, supply policies, French participation was equally important, but for exactly the opposite reason. Um, the French during this period were not party to the NPT. Uh, they were exploring some very sketchy deals, exporting you know, nuclear equipment, nuclear supplies to Pakistan, Argentina, Brazil, and a host of other countries, a number of whom eventually proliferated. Um, it really took some persuading to get France to join the group, and I'd be happy to go into that during Q&A. Uh, but the group's troubles didn't end there. France was staunchly opposed to making full-scope safeguards a condition of nuclear supply, 
and the Soviet Union had taken exactly the opposite approach. So the United States kind of found itself in the middle having to act as a broker between these two different sides. Um, the U.S. showed extreme flexibility in making sure that, that neither of these groups walked away. Um, and in fact, they, they were even willing to modify their own um, nuclear export policies, relax them a little bit to make uh, cooperation with French nuclear industry um, more feasible. But this didn't prove to be compelling to the French side. Um, Nevertheless, it demonstrated to the Soviet side that the United States was an honest broker and that it was genuinely trying to help kind of reconcile these two different viewpoints. And in fact, we see from the declassified cables that, you know, the Soviet side acknowledged, yes, we, we see that it's, it's very difficult for the United States to be in this position. And it's true that we probably don't want to push France too hard because they could walk away. Um, so perhaps for that reason, the, the Soviet side stopped insisting so um, intractably on CSAs as a condition of supply and as on full scope safeguards. And the United States and Soviet accommodations in this respect allowed the group to come to a consensus agreement about a set of guidelines in November of 1975. Um, my final example of, of US-Soviet cooperation in the context of the London Club um, comes when plans for a West German export of a full nuclear fuel cycle to Brazil came to light in 1975, just as the group was kind of coalescing around a set of guidelines. Um, Germany, West Germany, I should say, at this time, was a member of the London Club. And so this really represented a make or break opportunity to kind of test the validity of the guidelines. Um, France, or I'm sorry, the United States was, was pressuring Brazil and Germany to conclude a tripartite safeguards agreement with the IAEA to make sure that um, whatever Germany was planning to export to Brazil was not used for nefarious purposes. And both sides did agree to do this, uh, and a vote on the agreement was set to take place at the IAEA Board of Governors meeting in February of 1976. The US was holding consultations with the other members of the London Club kind of lobbying them to support this deal and, and trying to feel out whether there were going to be any big issues ahead of the vote. Um, they learned that the USSR had major concerns about the start date for the application of safeguards as written in the text of this agreement. And uh, the USSR saw these as being in violation of the London Club guidelines that they had just worked so hard to come to a consensus agreement about. Um, the Soviet side did threaten to veto the agreement, uh, which the German side saw as a Soviet attempt to make, um, to kind of set a precedent that the Soviets would always have a say in exactly what the Germans did in this space, which obviously they didn't like. Um, both sides were looking to the United States for resolution. So the American delegation had to serve as a mediator on this particular conflict. And it arranged meetings, we can see from the declassified cables between the two sides, kind of acted as a middleman in, in a game of telephone between these two delegations to help resolve their interests. The night before the vote, the situation appeared pretty grim. Um, the USSR refused to come to a meeting of all of the London Club parties, but the United States, again, agreed to represent the Soviet interests at this meeting and then report back to the USSR. And I think they all breathed a sigh of relief at the vote when uh, the US, the, the Soviet delegation got up to speak and said, you know, yes, we've had some really serious issues with this deal, but having talked to all the parties, we can now confidently say that we're comfortable with it and we feel that the London Club guidelines are being upheld. So the vote uh, went through. So what can we learn from the nature of, of US-Soviet cooperation from this case? I think first and foremost, we know that ACTA was correct in thinking the Soviet Union, Soviet Union would be a good partner on uh, export control issues. So despite some serious differences between the two sides, they functioned cooperatively and productively uh, in this setting until the London Club stopped meeting in 1978. Um, in part, this is because, as I've indicated before, I think the Soviet Union saw the United States as an honest broker. It was smart of the United States to approach the Soviet Union first and demonstrate that it truly cared about their perspective and their buy-in and their willingness to accommodate the Soviet perspective uh, in the context of these negotiations going forward, I think was a, a, a good faith effort to um, make sure that the Soviet Union was happy with the outcome. Second, and this is um, 
I think, significant. The Soviet Union did take a very hard line on nuclear exports and, and were very interested in, in having full scope safeguards be a condition of nuclear supply. Um, I think the United States was equally appreciative of the need for school, full scope safeguards, but they weren't as willing to um, try to push that with their own allies. So in the context of the group, the Soviet Union actually played a really important role for the US. It kind of did the dirty work for the US so that the US had a little bit of latitude to negotiate um, between the two sides. Um, and then third and finally, both countries were really cooperating quite closely on NPT issues. The individual players knew each other really well by this point. Um, and there was an expectation that cooperation for non-proliferation would be successful rather than rather than something difficult. Um, so I think, just to conclude, although the issue of full scope safeguards did eventually bring the group to a halt in 1978, and they did not meet again until the 1990, until 1990, um, these observations that I've tried to highlight here, I think really provide some valuable insights into the conditions that enabled cooperation on this particular issue. Um, I think some of them can be usefully applied for us today, and, and we'll get into looking at how that would work in our general recommendations at the end.